So recently I made a Daisy film that uh, has a lot of offline mode cinematics, like a lot of cutscenes in it. And I've had a lot of questions about how to set that kind of stuff up. So rather than, uh, you know, answer a million DMs and try to guide people through it one by one, I'm just going to make a tutorial that kind of explains it in depth. Um, I'm going to cut out any loading screens or crashes or whatever else so that you can see this pretty quick. But aside from that, this is going to be a long one because I'm going to show literally every step so you can see everything in action. So to get started, launch Daisy, just a vanilla launcher. I don't actually use the Daisy SA launcher or anything like that for this. Um, launch up the launcher and uh, navigate to the mods tab. Now, depending on what mods you want to have running for like a specific server, if you're trying to create a specific look like I did for Stalker, uh, you'll want some certain ones, but there are some really important uh, key ones to grab. Namely, for me, uh, the Daisy editor you always want to have as that's what allows you to do a lot of the um, sort of unique bits and pieces. Uh, but aside from that, all these other ones that I have here listed, build a Builder items, CF, DAPS framework, Windstride, Stalker Z. All of these ones are specific to the Stalker Z server uh, setup, uh, which you can find by looking at uh, the server in the mod list or in Daisy SA Launcher and seeing what mods that they have on the server. Um, once I selected all of these, I uh, went ahead and made a preset over here um, so that whenever I want to switch to specifically some Stalker Z stuff, I can do so. That's it. Once you've got those ticked, go ahead and launch. All right, so edit is launched and we can get started. So I don't really know why there's cameras that fall from the sky here, but um, if, if you see this and you see this, yeah, you've probably got Daisy Editor working, which is which is good. Um, all right, so uh, Jesus, go ahead and hit open editor down the bottom right. And uh, depending on what map you want to load, go ahead and select which one's your preference. For me, Stalker Z, Exclusion Zone is the current map that uh, is used on the server. So I'm going to go ahead and open that one. Okay, so it's loaded up. I'm going to go over a couple of keybinds that you're going to find super duper useful for doing things very quickly and efficiently. Uh, so first of all, if you tap Y on your keyboard or Z on a German keyboard, uh, that will toggle the UI, the heads up display. If you tap the home key, it will jump you into game mode where you can begin you know, doing some stuff. Uh, if you tap spacebar, that'll allow you to switch between editing, uh, selecting objects, you know, things like that, and actually navigating the viewport, so being able to control the camera. If you hold control uh, and click on any entities, you can select and copy them. Uh, so I think like, if I want to grab this tree here, for example, if you want some extras. If you click on an object, you can hit delete to get rid of it. If you hold down shift while navigating, you'll move the viewport faster. And if you hold down alt, you'll go a little bit slower, which is really good for setting up those nice uh, little uh, close-up cameras. Um, there's a bunch of others, but uh, you can look on the Steam Workshop page for the Daisy Editor, which will give you the full list of controls. So. Some other key things that are really useful to know uh, that aren't listed in the control list itself is the view and the editor options. So up here you have access to view camera, which is where you're going to control uh, all your actual filmic settings. So the FOV of the camera, how tight the lens is or how wide it is. The Gaussian blur, which is just blurring the screen. Near plane is how close entities can reach the camera before they begin to fade out. So like, you know, if you get close to someone, if the near plane is like pretty big, they're going to start disappearing uh, before they fully entered the camera. Depth of field blur is going to be your camera's aperture. And the depth of field distance is going to be the focal point of the lens. So this way you can get some nice kind of, you know, shots where you've got like a, an entity close in the foreground, but everything else is blurred out. You also have your typical options of vignetting, sharpness, and exposure, uh, filters, if you want to do like your color correction and color grading inside the editor. Don't really recommend that. I'd suggest doing that in post in something like Premiere or DaVinci Resolve, but you can if you want to. Uh, under the editor tab, this is where you can find your preferences for a bunch of different settings. 
Uh, some important ones I usually change is the autosave timer or even autosave in the first place so that if you're recording stuff you don't have autosave popping up the top. Here you can also control the camera's speed which is super useful if you're going to be doing some uh, you know smaller scenes and stuff. You can also enable the rule of thirds tool if you're pretty new or even if you're not sometimes it's just good to have a nice little uh, little reminder um, but enabling the the rule of thirds grid so you can frame your shots a little bit more effectively you know keep uh keep some characters and kind of key points in the frame keep some characters sort of central in the frame um and uh once you hit the uh ui off it hides as well so you can keep this active the whole time be you know kind of framing some stuff sort of nice based on these and then you can get rid of it when it's time to uh, actually film um there's also the environment settings up here, which is where you can control the date. So that's whether it's, you know, summer, autumn, winter, spring, which will change uh, the lighting intensity and the kind of uh, time of day lighting changes. So say early in the morning in summer, it's going to be a lot brighter than it is in, say, winter. You can also control how much rain that there is, which comes with a bit of fog. You can control the fog on its own, which I do believe uh, is multiplicative. Multi yeah, multiplicative. Uh, so it exponentially increases based on both the fog and the rain. So they are two independent fogs. You can control the overcast, which is... Uh, let me just turn this off, actually, real quick. There we go. No more rule of thirds. You can control the overcast, which is how cloudy it is. For the Stalker Z or the AOD exclusion zone... Um, if you max out the overcast, it's actually what turns on emissions, if you wanted to see what that looks like. And yeah, that is the environment settings. There are some other settings in the preferences you may wish to sift through and control yourself. Uh, there's markers, brushes, themes, advanced. There's a lot of different things in here that you can mess about with and change around the view distance. Um, but it's up to you how much time and effort you want to put into all of that. Now, into the thicker things. So actually working on setting up characters, setting up their poses, stuff like that, because I'm sure that's what most people are super interested in. So the first thing I usually do is obviously scope out where I'm gonna be filming uh, a scene. So let's say I'm gonna have a, um, let's just say a mercenary is crouched down here in Junkyard, or maybe a stalker, and he's kind of like sitting behind a truck here. And uh, we're gonna have a nice kind of frame of him like this. We're going to have some, you know, maybe a bloodsucker walking in the background or some such. So I'm going to show you how to set that up. I tend to move my viewport a little ways away from where I actually want to film to set up all the entities, like all the objects and things that the character's using. So as before, hit spacebar to switch from the viewport back to controlling uh, the menu itself. First thing you want to do is search for Survivor. These are going to be the character models or the actual uh, characters that uh, you'll be controlling for your scenes. By default, if you just jump into game mode with the home key, you'll be playing as that builder entity. Um, but if you want to be playing a specific character or multiple characters, you're going to want to pick someone from here. So I'm going to pick uh, Elias. Now, I'm not sure why it does this, but whenever you load up a survivor, they don't display immediately. But if you double click on their entity, they'll, uh, they'll become visible. Let's uh, let's turn him around real quick. So, what are we gonna kid him out with? Um, I'm gonna make this guy a, you know, let's make him a freedomer because uh, you know they like artifacts. Maybe there's an artifact that's gonna be in the foreground instead. So first things first, you're gonna go looking for all the entities you want them to be kitted out in. I usually have a rough idea of what my guys are gonna be wearing, so I'm gonna go ahead and just search for free or if you're having trouble finding some freedom stuff sometimes uh entities are named in the russian variations so svoboda svoboda i think is how it's spelled yep um name or name is the name given to some of the mercenary equipment um sometimes characters are called mono sometimes they're called monolith it varies You'll just have to uh, get used to searching and sort of figuring out all the entities that are in this list. There's billions, so good luck if you're running as many mods as I am. Uh, but let's start with 
free. So I'm going to find this guy a nice, uh, let's go with a sunrise set, I think is a classic. So I'm going to grab him, yeah, Daisy RP, sunrise top, and pants. Give him the vest as well. I'm going to get this guy a nice uh, belt. Module belt's pretty typical for Stalker Z, so I'm going to grab that one. Um, I'm going to give him some sort of... Uh, Probably some sort of helmet, or maybe a beanie. Yeah, a beanie looks nice. We'll get him a, uh, a shamog. This little face mask we're going to be wearing. And uh, let's get him some boots. Well, the boots that match to this set, I believe, are the military black. So we'll grab those ones. Now, no freedomer is complete without a Vela's detector. So we'll give him one of those. We'll grab one of those nice... Um, Artifact containers. Uh, I think grab. Yeah, the alloy one. And we'll grab him a, uh, a backpack as well. I think a hunting bag would look good. Um, we'll just grab him. I think there's a freedom specific one. I think it's listed on this for Boda. Boda's for Boda. Yeah, here we go. Good enough. Oh, and of course, gloves. You kind of, kind of a guy without gloves. It's just goofy. Let's give him those nice uh, FS mini gloves. Black, yeah, those are nice. All right, I've wasted a lot of time kitting out this guy, so I'm just going to go with that. I will spare him having a weapon or such, but I will show off some weapon stuff after this shot as well, so you guys can see how that kind of stuff is set up. So strip him down. The clothing items are going to stay there, so that's why, again, I put my stuff out of sight of where I'm going to be shooting. And then we're going to drip him out. So grab all these pieces. There is a bug that's pretty frequent with the editor mode. You may notice, you may come to hate it. Sometimes you'll be locked out of your inventory. I don't fully understand why it happens, but it does. I have yet to find a solution, so... Um, I apologize for that. If you ever find you press tab and nothing happens, that is unfortunate, but it is what it is. Now let's move him over to where I was going to shoot. I'm gonna put the uh, container down here as a nice bit of set dressing. Mess around with the placement of that. Um, now one thing that's super important for setting up characters, which is going to become massively helpful, is that whenever you tap Y to switch back to controlling, some editor controls while you're still in the character, They'll be frozen in place. Same thing happens if you click the home key. So if you wanted to catch, you know, someone in a pose or such, you can, for example, throw a heavy punch, tap the home key, and uh, where is he? You'll find that they are frozen exactly where you screenshotted them. So you can catch some nice, uh, nice various poses and stuff of characters, multiple characters doing things, stuff like that. Which is where you find a lot of those shots of where I've got characters kind of like, you know, posing together, just chilling, some of them like leaning up against the wall or stuff like that. Uh, that's how that goes about. Now, uh, let's get this guy into a nice pose, just something like this I'm thinking. You know, he's crashing down, he's kind of looking around the corner like he's been looking for this artifact. I'm gonna hit Y to freeze the controls, and I'm gonna hit home to switch back. So now I've got a nice pose like this. I'm gonna upright his container so that it's uh, a little bit more visible from the ground. Ooh. Oh, whoever did the pivot on this thing, you're a monster. Look at that. It's like... It's like halfway. It's got a 65 degree angle. That's monstrous. Um, yeah, that'll do. Um, let's give him a nice, uh, nice anomaly to be in the foreground. Um, I'm just going to pick maybe the Electra, or let's go with... Um, yeah, Fruit Punch. It's always a nice one. Got a very kind of dramatic, and you see billions of those in junkyard or in truck cemetery, so it's always good. Now, one of the most important things about the Daisy Editor um, is the camera controls, the cinematic camera. Now, I will preface this by saying the controls of this are very rudimentary. This is not a dope sheet. There is no graph editor. There is no tangent editing. There is no anchors that you can pull and play around with. None of that. It is a simple point-to-point -point camera tool. 
you set A, you set B, you press play, it goes between. There is some smoothing you can mess around with for different results, but in general, you can't do some crazy stuff like, you know, a camera that follows someone, comes to a complete stop for a few moments, slowly panning around and picks up speed without there being some uh, unpredictability, some jank to it that you can't control. So temper your expectations and shoot with what you have, not with what you wish you had is generally how I have the best success. So I'm going to get a nice shot of uh, just something simple. Like, you know, we kind of got this guy in the foreground here. We're just going to do something really basic. So I'm going to hit add node here and uh, that's going to add a camera track. Now the controls we do have is the position and the orientation. We also have fly to, which will move you from wherever you are to where the camera was made or is currently set to. We have the segment time, which is how long it takes to get from this camera to the next one. We have delete, which obviously gets rid of this particular track. And we have set from current, which is going to update the position orientation to whatever your viewport currently is. Now, because this is going to be a pretty small scene, I'm gonna type the FOV. Um, I, should, I should probably talk through stuff as I do it. I'm gonna go back up to view camera and here is where we can change the FOV. So we can get something a little bit more tight lens, like maybe a, maybe a 32 millimeter or something, maybe even, yeah, you know what, that looks fine. So I've set my camera here. Now what I'm gonna do is go ahead and add a second node. You can either move to where you want the new node to be and hit add and it will set the position orientation or you can add it, then sort of position yourself roughly to where you wanna be and then you can once again uh, set from current here. I'm gonna set the time to about 15, maybe 20 seconds. And uh, when you hit run down the bottom right, that is going to trigger the movement of the camera. While this is happening, you can tap Y to switch back to uh, no UI so you can fully see what's going on. Now that's pretty rudimentary. It's very simple. Uh, kind of a, a pan and slight dolly going on here. Nothing too crazy. Uh, but what we can do is we can start to spice this up a little bit. So changing around the environment, the lighting uh, is a great way to sort of set the scene to have a little bit more impact. So one of the first things you can do is uh, depending on the FOV of your camera, you can mess around with the aperture and the focal distance to make the camera appear more kind of closer to its real world counterpart. Uh, so for this, it's a tight lens, so it's gonna be a pretty strong aperture and I'm gonna have the focal point be on uh, the freedom. So he's gonna be in the foreground, uh, his sort of primary focus. If you're ever curious as well, by the way, um, this is something I can't explain in a short tutorial, how to how to frame, how to do cinematography, stuff like that. There's a lot of tutorials out there if you're interested to kind of learn more about it. Um, but the best one that my boss always taught me was that foreground makes the framing round. So if you want a shot to look good, make sure you have uh, entities or cameras that fill into the foreground, you have entities or things that fill into the middle ground, and you have some stuff that fills into the background. But the biggest one, almost always is to have something in the foreground, whether that's you focusing on a camera or, or a character like this and they're the foreground, or you have something between you and them that creates a foreground. That's, um, I guess, the shortest crash course on some cinematography basics. Again, I'm not gonna get too into that stuff here. What I'm gonna do is go up to view camera and here we're going to set the focal blur I'm gonna just, usually what I do is I'll max it out pretty heavy and then I'll mess around with the distance till it's roughly focused on my character. So about 1.5 is where he kind of comes into focus a little bit. Then I can just pull the depth of field down till it's uh, fairly focused on him. Now the controls are not very granular. You can't go to like one, for example. The lowest is 1.5 and then three. So trying to focus on some really close-up stuff can be kind of hard, and sometimes you have to bite the bullet and adjust your shot if you really want to get something in focus like this. Which is unfortunate. It kind of stifles creati creativity a little bit, I guess, but again, we work with what we have. So that's kind of nice. We've got some, you know, some stuff going on. The framing here is not perfect. It's a little bit rushed. Like maybe we want to have it more like kind of this, but I'm going to go with the, the keys I've already made. Um, I'm going to jump back into the environment tools and I'm going to mess around with the uh, the time of day a little bit. So 
maybe it's uh, maybe it's early in the morning because what this allows us to do is put in some lights of our own because Daisy's lighting yeah I mean it's not the worst I've seen but it also doesn't really have the concept of light bounces so inside this container for example is just as bright as outside of it. it does have some occlusion stuff it does here and there but for the most part you could be inside a completely closed off building and it's still going to be just as bright as everything else um, like even under here this should be dark basically so what i tend to do is i will kill the lights and i'll light stuff myself as often as i can because you can usually get better results that way i don't know if the dark night lighting config works here i don't think it does so, lighting. Um, I'm not sure exactly which mod this comes from. I'm pretty sure it's Daisy Editor. But if you search for lights, you will find both network spotlight and network point light. Uh, a point light is going to be an omni light. It casts light in all directions, whereas a spotlight is going to have a, a texture of some sort that kind of creates a cone shape. So we're gonna use um, the spotlight for the most part. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to give this guy a nice bit of rim lighting from the front. That's going to be the green from this fruit punch here. And then I'm going to create a very soft light from behind him and a key light coming from somewhere over here. So that way, a basic three-point lighting setup we can get going to make things look a little bit nicer. So I'm going to start by turning this around, maybe to like a uh, yeah, roughly 135, maybe 155 degree angle. I'm going to pull back on the radius because this isn't a crazy intense light. I'm going to pump up the brightness to get that kind of room framing around the outside of the character. I'm going to mess around with the coloring here as well to get it a little bit closer to the you know, kind of expected color of a fruit punch. Kind of intense sort of alien green that's a little bit unnatural. From there, I'm going to increase the brightness a little ways. I'm going to pull back on the radius just a little bit more because I want to just kind of reach in a little bit. I don't think I can control it too crazy, but already you can see we're getting some more uh, more interesting, more evocative sort of results here. So I'm going to move on to the um, sort of fill light as well. This is gonna be pretty, pretty close range one, very low brightness. This is to fill in the gaps of darkness that are a little bit unnatural. Um, it's not gonna to matter too much here because again, I think it's maybe the time of year, but everything is still kind of fill lit. But if you're filming something like a scene that happens in maybe, um, maybe winter, no, everything seems to be pretty bright. It's a little bit unusual. But in scenes where that's not the case, what you're going to want to do is create a fill light just to kind of fill in where you'd expect the light to be bouncing. So even here, you can actually kind of see a little bit. He's very dark on this side, which is good for some shots, for very like artistic ones. But considering everything around him is pretty lit, you'd be expecting the light to bounce a little bit more. Um, maybe it's his clothing that impacts it a little bit too. Uh, but from a creative level, I find it usually looks better if you at least make characters look a little bit lit up, nothing crazy. So I'm gonna pull the radius down pretty low. I wanna make sure the brightness stays even lower. The lowest you can do is 0.3. I wish it could be 0.1, but we'll make up for that by just pulling the actual diffuse color down a little bit so it's a little bit darker. So all that's going to do is create a little bit of light around the outside. It's still going to be pretty dark, which is good, but you can at least see him. It's not like a completely dark abyss on this side. Now, I did say I was going to create a key light over here. I'm going to try it, but I think it might actually be okay with just the two. Having this, instead of be just the rim light, this is actually kind of a key light itself, um, as that's where most of the light's coming from in the scene. Kind of ended up brighter than I thought I was gonna make it, but it looks pretty cool. Now when you can, you wanna try to create uh, lights at a roughly like 45 degree angle towards a character. Um, but like with all things, rules can be bent, they can be broken. You can get some cool results even by not following that. Um, so I'm gonna run this camera again. Yeah, so like I was saying earlier, I think it might actually be detrimental to have this extra light. Maybe we can give that kind of moonlight look to it, have this, even though it's a key light, it's more of like an extra fill light or something like that. So just that little bit of blue coming in there. Nothing too wild. Now I'm gonna raise this light up a little bit and I'm gonna take out the flare on it so that we're not looking at um, 
like a, a random light flare in the middle of this. There's also the problem of grass not casting shadows. Um, so you've got him casting a shadow here, but the light's kind of just bleeding through and you get this very flat lit sort of a look here. Again, limitations of Daisy. There's only so much we can do, uh, but we'll do our best to make this look good even with that. Um, for the most part, that's mostly it for creating this, but I'm going to add a little bit more, a little bit more interest. Uh, we're going to grab an artifact. Um, I don't really remember what comes out of a uh, fruit punch, so don't at me. I'm going to put a collar block in there and just have that sort of floating like here. We had a little bit more visual injury, so you can see what he's kind of going towards. Maybe it's even like a little bit closer. It's like nearby it. Now, if you want, that could be it. You could leave the scene like that. This guy has discovered this sort of, uh, this artifact, and that's where it is. He's kind of, like, preparing himself to come up towards it. If you want, you can keep messing around for as long as you want to kind of create the lighting, getting it somewhere closer to what you might sort of envision. I'm thinking maybe even pulling back on the lights here and uh, doubling down on that kind of bluish light I created to sort of not have the... Uh, not have the fruit punch be the primary. Let's say I actually pull from this one a little bit more. Brighten this up to kind of a blue, bluish sort of tint. Increase the brightness on that a little bit. So we get this kind of like, you know, sort of moonlight effect going on instead. And, uh, you know, we can sort of increase the intensity of it uh, either here or in post. But I don't want to get too much into detail on you know, the intricacies of lighting. This is stuff you can find from other tutorials and get into depth with it. But that's the basics of creating a shot with the character posed and in position and such. There are some quick extra things I want to show you. These are very hacky, but they are key to creating some slightly wilder sort of shots. So I'm going to pull us back to daytime. Uh, I'm going to kill the depth of field blur because we really don't need it. And I'm going to pull my guy somewhere a bit easier to sort of see. I'm going to drag him over here. So you might be wondering, all right, if I want to, um, maybe I want to have my camera sort of playing while this guy is moving around. So I'm going to set two camera keys. I'm going to put one here and one here. Something really simple. Just a little pan like this. Jesus. Scare the fuck out of me. But let's say you want this guy slowly turning over his shoulder, looking behind him. Well, you can use the control player control up here, but you might be thinking like, okay, I've done it. He's not moving, nothing's happening. I press spacebar, can't move. You do need to enable the simulation on the character, which you can do by double clicking on them, either here or in the list, and going to enable simulation. That's going to turn him on. Unfortunately, I don't know why this is the case, but um, even when control player is disabled, he'll always do whatever the health action is. Like if you left click, he's gonna left click. Which is weird, but it is what it is. So what you can do then, and this does take some skill, some planning, some time. You can pull off some shots that have characters moving around. So let's say you hit run in here. You have the guy sort of roughly where you want it to position him. And you have him holding alt and slowly turning to like look around the area. Maybe that's the kind of shot you were hoping to pull off. Sort of a thing. Now you can go a little bit further with this, because this is very cool. If a character is uh, walking... You might be thinking, okay, I want this guy walking. That's great, easy, done it. But let's say you've got this guy here and uh, you've also got, let me, uh, let me let him go for a sec. You've also got Mr. Joe Schmo off to the side who you want to be walking alongside him, which I did a lot of scenes in the film that uh, involved this kind of short composition. Two characters walking side by side, a bunch of characters walking side by side. There are limitations to what you can do with it, but it is perfectly possible to an extent. Enabling simulation on characters does impact performance uh, the more spread out they are. And it does reach a certain point where you can no longer, unless you have like some sort of supercomputer and you've somehow got Daisy running amazingly, um, it's going to slowly drop in frames. I haven't found a way to work around it and it reaches the point where you can't select entities because the frame lag is too high. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this guy as my playable character I'm going to jump into game mode by ha uh, tapping the home key. Now I want this guy to just be walking down the street. So I'm gonna double tap control. So walk is, uh, is now automatic. I'm gonna keep walking. 
So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit the home key while he's walking. You can see he abruptly stops. That's, you know, not what we want. We're like, okay, well, how do you get him walking then? Well, if you have a character in an action and you double click on them, this automatically ticks the enable simulation option, or you can do that automatically. But they're going to keep walking if they were already walking. So what you can do with this is I'm gonna disable that. I'm gonna pull him back a ways to here. I'm gonna put him maybe somewhere like this. I'm gonna enable this guy. I'm gonna take control of this guy. And what that should do is that should allow me to basically have this guy walking through the frame while he is also under my control and moving. So, enable his simulation, enable control. It is very much a juggling act. I'm gonna hit run and we now have a shot like this. This guy is kind of walking by. That's how you get some of those more advanced ones. You know, the characters marching side by side with guns in hands, that kind of thing. It is very limited. You can use run simulation as well to um, enable zombies or bloodsuckers, any creatures you've placed to fight against you. You can also use it so that you could shoot someone and when they die, you hit the home key, you jump back out and now they're like mid falling animation. You jump back into the camera, you really enable simulation, boom, they're falling, you get your animation. Again, it's a massive juggling act. If you wanna pull it off, it does take some time. You need to be ready to repeat yourself, especially if you're doing many characters at the same time, because if you have a bunch of guys that are walking side by side, trying to time them so you enable this one, let him start walking, enable that one, you might need to do it like a marathon race, where you've got one character here, one here, one here, one here, and so you enable from the slowest one to the next one to the next one to the next one, so they're walking in sync. But yeah, I think that covers the most part. Um, with my scenes in post, I always take them into a program like Premiere, After Effects, or DaVinci Resolve Fusion to do some post-processing. That's color grading it, adding any particle effects or extra fog that I might want to add to kind of increase the, um, increase the quality of the shots. You can, again, do the color grading in, um, in Daisy itself, but the options are very limited. You can't apply uh, a LUT filter, you can't mess around with the um, specific areas that you can't mask a certain area and like, you know, maybe you just want to increase the contrast of certain colors on here. It's very limited. I recommend don't do that, do it in post. But aside from that, I hope that covers the most part of how I've done some scenes in offline mode. If you guys get stuck, have any questions, you're not sure about something, again, still free to reach out, ask. I'll do my best to explain um, as you can see from this, a lot of it's a very hacky workflow, so I've had to abandon a lot of dreams of certain shots I wanted to do. Unfortunately, not much can be done about it. It's just the way it is. The last thing I want to note, and you're going to probably hate this, even if you save, your characters will not be wearing the same clothes that they were when you saved. They will not be posed in the same place they were when you saved. So you cannot come straight back to a scene and recapture or redo the shooting. Because, on top of that, the cinematic cameras, they are also not saved when you save, so these will be lost. Uh, the FOV of your camera is also lost when you jump into game mode. As you might have seen now, I'm back to a pretty basic wide lens when I was on a tight lens earlier. A lot of stuff is not saved. This is one of the most destructive workflows I have encountered. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. The developers who have made this have made a very powerful tool that we can do a lot with. Um, but again, it is not its own engine. This is still working in the confines of Daisy, And these are people that are not, um, I presume this is not their day job. They're not devoting every hour of every day to making this the most comprehensive editor in the world. It's still incredibly powerful. The stuff we can do with it is very awesome. So I hope you guys have fun making some content. And like I said earlier, if you have any questions or if I've missed anything, feel free to reach out and I will do my best to explain stuff to you. Um, but yeah, this has been Wombat explaining how to make uh, the Daisy movies. Um, I don't have an intro or an outro, so uh, goodbye.